Okay, gonna stop you there. Doesn't matter if they're messy or unformed or partial, we're just after your impression of where you're at now. Uh, so who would like to volunteer? There was a very confident group that had finished early. Yeah, do you wanna, do you wanna volunteer yours then? As is, uh, commissioning is a continuous process that helps to create space for communities to support improved outcomes. No long <laughs> Helps create space for communities. And public services. <laughs> and public services to deliver improved outcomes. Support. Oh. Support improved outcomes. So that's a improved. Thank you. Great. Okay. Who's next? We've got it's a continual cycle to improve and maximise the efficiency and the spectrum, you know, to meet the conventional outcomes. So we've got it's a continual cycle. Improve and maximise service efficiency and effectiveness. Yeah. To lead better outcomes. Good. Who's next? Identify and secure. The <laughs> right outcomes, right place, right time, right cost. Ah. Sorry, my writing's terrible, but I, I can read it, so I'll read it back to you. Don't worry, thank you. That's good. Yep. Okay. Lots of sentences, so <coughs> you know, understanding the needs of the given population, taking the children available to be children, and Oh, that's it, is it? You said there was lots of sentences, that's very succinct, thank you. <laughs> Understanding the needs of a given population and the total resources available. Interesting, interesting. Thank you, thank you. Uh, great. So, uh, do do you want to go at the front here, or yep? Welcome. Yours is the longest. Well, I've not got much space left, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, a collaborative way of working that takes you through the cycle of understanding need, co-producing and designing solutions, facilitating change and reviewing with a focus on outcomes and transformation. Co-producing and designing solutions yeah. and then reviewing. Facilitating the change. Oh sorry, facilitate the change. And reviewing with a focus on outcomes and transformation. Thank you. Um, I'm getting the gist of it. So, and I think the final one over here is that right? Um, it's a, a continuing process, a continual process, working with stakeholders. Yep. To identify outcomes, implement delivery mechanisms to meet those outcomes, and review the effectiveness. Right, uh, and review, lots of long words in these I have to uh, note, <laughs> great, thank you. Did I get them all? What, what, what can we say looking, stepping back and having a look at these? So, continual process to working with stakeholders to identify outcomes, implement mechanisms and re review effectiveness. Commissioning is a continuous process that helps create the space for communities and public services to support improved outcomes. Continuous cycle of improvement and, oh blimey, maximisation of service efficiency and effectiveness generating increased outcomes, identify with vulnerable people and secure the right outcomes in the right place at the right time at the right cost, understand the needs of a population and the total resources to meet them uh, in order to improve outcomes, collaborate uh, to generate understanding, co-produce solutions uh, and design delivery uh, type of thing, facilitate change and transformation and review with a view on outcomes and transformation. I've garbled them a bit but you get the general thing. So, so what are, the, what are, are, there, are there some differences, are there some commonalities that you can see in there? Outcomes is in there 
Outcomes is very often kind of in there as the last word, and I don't know what that means, if it's kind of been bodged into an existing mindset, or if it's just there at the last because it's the fundamental, most important thing to hit. Um, people? People seem to be in all of them. Yeah, almost all of them. Yeah, 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 and there's, there's a fair bit of doing with, or creating the space to, which is interesting to see. Lots of continuous, lots of cycles, lots of things with bits of review in. Anything else? I, I mean, I would say there's a bit of, you can read into people's different contexts a little bit from this, can't you? I would say that understanding the needs of a population comes, you know, from a particular type of service perspective, most likely, if, that, if that's fair, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, although you can understand how it could be applied to a general place based all of the outcomes as a whole, that language is most often used in things like public health, in terms of like teams like social care where you're focusing on a specific population. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments on that? So I think none of these are wrong, I think they're all quite good, none of them are perfect and um, the point is that we um, recognise that there are lots and lots of definitions of outcomes. I won't read them to you because you've got them all uh, in front of you. Um, the Norwich one is probably prototypical of this type. In the entire cycle of assessing the needs of people in a local area, designing services to address those needs and securing a cost-effective service in order to deliver better outcomes. That's quite similar to the flavour, I think, of what you've mostly put. There's less co-production-y with, pe with people. It's very... Uh, we will sort of do it for them and to them and work it out because uh, we're the ones who have uh, the power. I think because it's a definition, we're only going to get that short snapshot, aren't you? That That's fair. Co-production is going to be more of a description of it, isn't it? That could well be. Yeah. That absolutely could be. Absolutely. Yeah, that, I, I don't have any argument with, well, with that. Um, although, although you could follow this one without any co-production. That's, that's the thing I would like to yeah, point yeah, out. It's yeah. it's underneath the definition. It is. You're quite right. You're quite right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. For me, it says something about the culture and commitment of the organisation to co-production, because if it isn't in that definition, are they really doing it if it's yeah, no, no. no, and that's a really, really important point. <laughs> yeah, strategies versus reality. Yeah, yeah. We know there's a massive gap, right? Um, uh, even in the best intention strategy, and most of them are not. Most of them are come up with in workshop room like this, and they sound plausible and they're kind of sellable to whoever needs to buy into it. And then you get on with doing whatever you're going to do anyway with or without some regard to that strategy. That's what happens most of the time in most organisations in, in reality. And actually, by the way, it's a process of structural coupling. It's a process of engaging with the people who you engage with and doing the things that it's natural for you to do with them or the, or the markets or the providers or whatever else that drives the real strategy. That's the dark matter of strategy that drives what actually changes in organisations, not what people say in a room like this most of the time. Hopefully that makes some kind of sense, but this is the level we're at at the moment, trying to understand definitions and where we're getting to. And these very much tie in with these kind of models. Who's familiar with these, with these models? Yeah, okay, great. And what can you say what you see? What do you see in these models? There's a cycle thing going on, um, which was very much reflected in that continuous and cyclical language that was used in uh, your definitions. Um, and these do vary. Um, I'm going to use the NHS, this was from World Class Commissioning a long time ago, but I, I note that the Health Foundation used it in their What's Cutting Edge Commissioning uh, article just a few months ago, which I wasn't best pleased about, frankly. Um, that one is very much NHS, very procurement focused. So um, that is very much about, um, and let me exaggerate to make a point, I think that a lot of these early phase commissioning concepts are not really about commissioning, they're actually about a bit being a bit more strategic in your procurement. So what we could say, and what honestly does quite often happen, is that what you do in a cycle like that is you analyse needs, so you're starting from a deficit, and you're analysing it using cold data extracted from context, because it has to be nationally comparable. Uh, who's still got an observatory, a data observatory in, the, in their area? Yeah? 
Um, and, and those are brilliant, and I really respect the people who work in them. But what I would say is that word observatory is an interesting bit of a giveaway. Because an observatory is where you look at things from a very great distance through a very long telescope. Yeah? So it's cold data which you need, but it's not the warm data of people's lives and communities and the way they live and the families. And the, the, it's, it's not what we would recognise. It's putting people into boxes. They've got diabetes or they haven't. Do you see what, do you see what I mean? So it's valuable. It's not, the whole, it's not the whole story. It's the deficit story in cold data. And then you go, oh my God, all of these needs, so little money, constantly reducing, and we have to buy it for a whole area. So then you go out to procurement, which you can do well or badly, but basically what you're doing is you're trying to stretch a limited amount of money to achieve as much outcome as you possibly can. So you're going to procure in bulk, you're going to simplify, standardise, go for a long-term contract and all the rest. Yeah? And then in theory, you have the monitoring uh, and the performance management and the evaluation, but actually, who actually gets to spend the time to do that evaluation and that, that lessons learned and that improvement for the next cycle. Very often that's the thing, maybe 25% of the time that gets done fully, either the performance management of the delivery or the analysis. So I'm exaggerating to make a point, right? And if you're buying a prison, then you've got to do it quite long term and you've got to engage with a market even if you're looking at internal bids as well and, and you, you better damn well make sure you do the monitoring and the evaluation afterwards. But can you see why I call that strategic procurement? And it's better than just panicking and going, oh no, we're running out of time, we've only got 12 months and we've got to do an OG process, we better get the pin, pin out and do the same as last time and do another five or seven years or do, we better do a 12 month extension with the current provider in order to give us a little bit of time to do some needs analysis. So it's an improvement on what happens a lot of the time anyway. But why might that strategic procurement approach to commissioning be somewhat limited? What does it leave out? I've dropped some fairly broad hints. Absolutely. No, no, it, it just doesn't have space for that. And the commissioning doesn't always link to procurement. That's true. They're, they're yep. separate things that, you know, the procurement yeah. has to be one of the options that you come out of when you... Yeah, right. In this model, procuring is explicitly fully a third of the steps, and that's not always our experience in real life, is it? No, no, that's right. Um, the Harrow model was much more broad. <laughs> Understand, plan, do, review. So it's just building in that learning cycle and emphasising. And, and I really like, this was Richard Field's first book about um, commissioning. Um, he's got these three uh, cogs moving simultaneously of plan, do and review with a need for an awareness of need and demand, desired outcomes, current services, current market and you really have to juggle and do a bit of all of those at once. Does that make sense? So even this concept that we have this grand cycle and we might know where we are in the cycle and we're at step one, step two, step three, step four, step five Sometimes that works and sometimes it's nice if you know where you are, but even if you're doing that NHS world-class commissioning cycle, you're probably in seven cycles at once, if you see what I mean, at different points of all of them and juggling all of those plates to try and get each of them done as well as you possibly can. So it doesn't really work like that. You don't really get to... And by the way, if you spend six months doing your strategic planning and your needs analysis, the world has changed and moved on, and you then have to spend nine months doing your OGU procurement, and the world has changed and moved on during that. And if you create a seven-year contract that's not got enough flexibility and you haven't built the relationships to manage that contract during the seven years, you're really in trouble because during that seven years, your budget might have gone down by 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent. And then what do you do, right? Um, so I was in a... Um, one of the early workshops on library outsourcing and competition. That's gone well, hasn't it? Um, and uh, it was that period when it was traditional to start every um, public sector gathering with a sort of hymn of mourning of uh, austerity and how difficult it all is and, and all of that kind of thing. And I was literally sitting between two people from John Lang, which then was brought up by Carillion, very nice people who really believed in their ability to deliver a good library service, and they passed a note in front of me that was written in really big writing as if they wanted me to read it, so I, I just couldn't help reading it. And it said, they're talking about 35% cuts. Our contract only has 5% annual savings, dot, 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 exclamation mark. So that's quite a good illustration of how the suppliers have a problem with, with this kind of framework and the shifting reality that we have to live in uh, at the same time. Does that, does that make sense? Sorry, that's my catchphrase. 
if you can think of something for me better to say, then does that make sense? Let, let me know. Um, uh, so you do have to juggle all of those things. Our experience, just to, just to, just to emphasise, is that commissioning is a cluster of processes, techniques and ideas. It's all about the individual, and it's a practice, it's something you have to get into, something you have to try and learn and build your knowledge of, and you can learn from others, but you have to experience it your, yourself. Um, and actually, commissioning is constantly uh, evolving. Um, so it's quite easy to say we're doing commissioning um, by following some steps. That's probably not going to get you the good stuff. Um, and specifically, we think commissioning really is about outcomes rather than procurement. Procurement can be a very, very important part of it. Um, you need to understand how you think the change is going to happen rather than outsourcing messes, uh, if you see what I mean. Um, uh, and get inside that model, whether it's the service design or the conceptual model, get inside that, uh, that ha how the outcomes will be achieved. Um, and we expect to see a, a shift in emphasis. So let, let, let me come on to this. The, the logic model here is that there are certain inputs, uh, but that it's the intervention that turns the inputs into the achieved outputs and all of that is the learning and understanding and the thing that we have to find some mechanism to have a grip of, even if it's letting the community do it but knowing why we think they can do it well, um, in order to achieve the whole system outcomes and the ultimate impact uh, of the change we want to, to happen. Those interventions don't have to be paid for services, whether they're in-house or out-house. They could be stimulation of behaviour change, they could be managing demand, influencing others, collaboration. Um, uh, and the point here is, uh, I'll, I'll come on to uh, a different model in, in a minute, that we're moving on from... Where, where commissioning came from, let's be really honest, is compulsory competitive tendering, right? If anybody remembers that back in the day. And an arguably ideologically driven drive uh, to market test and outsource a lot of public services. And certain local authorities, and I was in Hammersmith and Fulham, we were very good at it, got very good at gaming the system and going through CCT and later on best value, but knowing what we had to do to tick the boxes and look really good while still doing what we basically wanted to do regardless of what the framework was. And I'm getting some quite blank faces here, but I don't think we were the only authority to do it. I think it happened quite a lot. And there were stories of you know, the in-house bid standing next to the official post box with two envelopes. One envelope was the high bid if there was no competitive bid. The the other was the low bid if you saw somebody else uh, who you recognise from, uh, from, from, from the you know, street cleansers or whatever. Uh, all kinds of stuff like that. Commissioning then <coughs> started in thinking about how can we get a yes-no outcome, how can we use our particular resources and budgets to achieve it. It was very competitive. We, we, we host um, hopefully an annual uh, event where we bring social care providers and commissioners together and it's commissioner, it was a commissioner at the first event who used the phrase race to the bottom first because a race to the bottom is what commissioning is very good at if it's done in that competitive way. Um, uh, it's responsive, driven by which targets do we have to meet, what's good enough in reducing uh, the incidences of um, uh, deaths due to diabetes or, or whatever else it may be. Um, and it's about the commissioner's priorities. Right? Commissioning 2.0, this is a good uh, report from the Institute for Government, is more personalised. It's about sharing resources and pooling budgets. It's about collaborative commissioning to get a range of outcomes. Prevention, demand reduction, co-production, co-creation, all of that jargon, actually. But what that really means is that we've got what we call shift one. Most of those definitions that we looked at earlier, and yours broadly escape this, but I think there's a hint of it still in there, talk about services. There will be a service. There's a need, there's a money, and therefore there'll be a service and it'll perform well or, or not well. Maybe 90% of the time that's going to be part of the outcome and the process of commissioning. But actually, um, are we thinking first about the outcome, second about the response, third about the, 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 the service, because there might be other delivery mechanisms than procuring a service. Yeah? 
And these are the questions that we ask when we're asking, have you achieved shift one? Moving from uh, there will be a service to thinking about what are the ways of achieving the outcomes we need to get? Yeah? And is that embedded throughout the commissioning process? So just a quick flavour. Who thinks their organisation is at commissioning 2.0 in their sort of day-to-day -day practice? Yeah, that's about half the course. Oh, good, we've got one. Um, who thinks their, uh, their, their own area is not even at commissioning 1.0 fully? Okay. But most, most of you, you're, you're around the commissioning 1.0 mark? Yeah? 1.5, all right, all right. One and bits of two, is that, yeah? One and little bits of two spread around, is that more like it? Yeah, okay. It, it really depends yeah. on the not cluster people in certain groups of needs, but it does have a lot to do with the how yes. far the personalisation is embedded within a certain Yeah. Certain and I think, I think commissioning in the NHS is one of the hardest places to do it, because at a certain level you have you know, designated cohorts and analysis units, you have template contracts and you're just trying to fit the two together. So that's really, really tough when we're talking about these kind of shifts. I know people have done very radical other things, so it is possible, but not always and not for everybody, it's, it's hard. Um, and, and similar models apply to constrict the possibilities of commissioning in all kinds of other services. Um, so uh, this is the definition of uh, shift from uh, services to outcomes that I won't go through further. Then there's shift two. <laughs> um, so we talk about the difference between conventional commissioning, which is based on needs, to asset aware commissioning, where we're taking assets into account. We're saying, well, there's an extent to which people can help themselves. There's an extent to which um, uh, we can create the conditions for healing, well-being, economic well-being uh, to take place. But that's just part of the picture. Whereas asset-based commissioning starts and is firmly rooted in that strengths-based view. Does that make sense? <laughs> so this is really moving from commissioning 2.0 to commissioning 3.0. And I hope that you all, in all of your commissioning practice, do have some recognition of assets. Of the, what, Does somebody want to give me a definition of assets? Sorry, you, you talked about it earlier on, didn't, didn't you? What? Oh, yes. Um, yep. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Oh, it's not necessarily even their problem to recognise it. Sometimes it's our problem to recognise it. Yeah. But in a world where loneliness has been proven to have the same effect as smoking, I think it's 20 cigarettes a day, in a peer-reviewed published paper, um, and our interventions are a world away from taking that sort of thinking into account, then we should be starting to take this kind of thinking into account. Okay. And commissioning is really about what's possible in the culture, in the context in which you're operating. So this is a nice, very broad definition of, of, of culture. So if you get your commissioning recipe right, it will come into the rituals and routines of your organisation, the, just the way things are done and the things that have symbolic significance. The control systems, the structures for sure, the power dynamics, the symbolism and the stories and myths that are told around the organisation. So I think this in a nutshell explains why just reorganising a council say into a commissioning function and a delivery function and a support function and having maybe a commissioner commissioning something from a delivery team and then both reporting to the same director doesn't necessarily automatically work in sort of generating a completely new culture and new way of doing things, right? So this is very important. Um, so uh, here are some questions to think about. What are the ingredients that we actually need to generate our commissioning culture? And these are a set of questions around power, structures, control systems, routines, stories, and symbolism. Yeah? So if you refer to people as service users, um, or you refer to them as people, that makes a deep change. Bless you. Uh, <laughs> unless that was just a, just a shock reaction to my statement. <laughs> um, uh, then that, that, that's, that's, that's deeply symbolic 
of how your organisation is likely to, to interact with your communities. Right? Just to take one example, if you refer to them as some police officers have been known to do as scrotes, that's probably symbolic as well. So, uh, what I'd like you to do is to get into um, small groups. Um, we're going to give you uh, 15 minutes for this. Um, and just think about what we've, we've just covered, uh, really. Um, so where are you at with commissioning? To what extent has shift one occurred? To what extent has shift two uh, occurred? Do you have a theory of how things are supposed to change that actually is underpinning your model? What, if anything, do you think needs to happen next? So I want a broad discussion of sort of where you're at. Be very honest with each other. Um, now might be a good time uh, to invite our Kafkas colleagues to split up around the room. Would, would that be okay?